Hello, and welcome everyone to Let's Talk Climate. I'm Jennifer Roberts, the director of Path to Positive Communities and your host for today. It's an extraordinary time for our country and I wanna just take a minute and acknowledge that many people are in extreme weather and crises right now um, with COVID. Many are on the front line. I just wanna thank our guests today for the work that they're doing thank all of our workers on the front lines um, and our local communities during these times of natural disaster and economic hardship. Our guests today are gonna to talk about how cities are managing multiple challenges at once and also continuing to move their local climate plans forward, even in a deeply divided country. We'll also touch on the importance of voting for climate action. I already received my mail-in ballot and I know our guests are gonna be very inspiring to see the positive action they're taking in their communities. So before we jump into our discussion, I have a few brief housekeeping items. The session is being recorded and will be available um, for on-demand viewing on, America's YouTube, on Eco America's YouTube channel. You can engage with us online using the hashtag, hashtag Let's Talk Climate. And you can use the chat function to ask questions throughout the webcast. Um, you can choose all panelists from the drop down, and then our staff are standing by to answer those questions. So, to send the questions to our panelists and have them answer. So, today our topic is climate politics in your community, make it local. Thanks for joining us. I am now going to welcome our amazing guests. First, we have the Honorable Ralph Becker, 34th Mayor of Salt Lake City, Utah current chair of the Central Wasatch Commission. And we have Honorable Sharon Weston Broom, who is the mayor president of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, because it is a city county government. And she is co-chair of the Mississippi River Cities and Towns uh, Initiative. So I wanna thank you both for being here. And if you're okay, we're gonna use first names um, in our conversation. So we're experiencing multiple concurrent crises and now the election season is on us and we have hyper-partisan attack ads. Um, it just feels like such a tense time in our country. So thank you for being here. Um, and I really am grateful for your willingness to share lessons learned uh, as cities are balancing their shrinking budgets with current demands and long-term climate goals and you have both had some success in that. So let's get started with our discussion. First, um, Mayor Broom, I wanna acknowledge that we know that your state has uh, just been hit by two recent hurricanes. And I just wanna check in with you um, and, and ask how you all are doing. And, and also, do you think that your citizens are making that connection between extreme weather and storms and climate change? Well, first, I want to uh, thank Eco America for this opportunity to share. And um, I will tell you that the recent incidents surrounding uh, Marco and Laura did not hit uh, Baton Rouge specifically and thankfully, uh, but our neighbors to the southwest uh, in Cameron Parish and Lake City of Lake Charles, they were hit very hard. The city of Lake Charles was was devastated. And so um, our citizens, because we have had, uh, uh, you know, extreme weather incidents, we've, we've weathered a major flood here in 2016. We weathered Hurricane Katrina. So we've had our share of crisis uh, weather events. So we have a strong empathy uh, for our neighbors. And so to that end, we have been reaching out and offering a response to our uh, neighbors in Lake Charles through resources. Uh, and that's, that's what we do. That's the spirit of Louisiana. And I will tell you, uh, I do believe that there is a growing knowledge and insight around the connection of uh, climate change to a lot of the extreme weather. I will tell you uh, that I, uh, I take every opportunity that I can when we're having this type of discussion uh, about weather, uh, about rain events, to make the connection for people, to say, look, 
Look at where we are today, how these weather events are rolling out, what we're experiencing, and contrast that to 20 years ago. You've got to know that something has transpired. And so we have had a journalist who has used the term, and I frequently use it, that we've been experiencing uh, showers on steroids. So we didn't have these showers on steroids 20 years ago and 30 years ago. So you've got to know that something is going on here uh, beyond the norm. That is, um, that's definitely a memorable term. Uh, I've also heard the term used that uh, climate is a threat multiplier. And uh, having on steroids, that's, a, that's another, um, another way of putting it. Um, so, you know, you talk about cities helping each other. And I know that uh, you mentioned Katrina that, you know, I'm based here in Charlotte. We had over 4,000 people come here from Louisiana and we're not right next door. So it's amazing how cities help each other and they all share the impact uh, of people who are fleeing the disasters. Um, and, and that's what, you know, I wanna talk about also um, when you mentioned making that connection, um, both of you are in uh, relatively conservative states. Um, you're in cities that are a little more progressive, but you're in states that, that are um, different. And tell us uh, something about some of the challenges and the successes that you've had um, in making that connection, uh, even though there are folks who still want to deny that climate change is happening or to push back on that. And we'll start with, um, with you, Ralph. Uh, Jennifer, thank you, and Eco America. The work you've been doing now for many years, extending back to the time when I was mayor, um, has been enormously valuable in helping us, uh, especially learn how to communicate about climate change, and in places, you know, places like where I live, where um, where the inevitability of the changes from our climate um, conditions uh, are now apparent, but were not so apparent years ago when many of us were taking the issue on as a as really a, a primary theme of our work. I know that was true, Jennifer, for your work in Charlotte as well. Um, it, it's um, I think a key, as Mayor Broom indicated, is to tie the obvious changes that people are seeing today to the overall conditions that are changing from, from the climate world. And, and um, when I started in this work, which was many decades ago, um, I, I almost couldn't even use the term climate change because it was it's so fraught with political implications for some people that they don't even hear the word. And I, so when I know I started really in a position to be able to really sort of take issues on when I became mayor in 2008, um, I seldom used the word climate change. I talked about we want a livable community. We want a healthy community. We want a sustainable community. And again, Eco America really helped me sort of refine and develop that language better. Uh, but in that era, as, as Mayor Broom said, 20 years ago, um, we, could, we knew what was happening even in our area, but they weren't so readily apparent. We weren't seeing these dramatic storm events to the extent we are today. We weren't seeing um, the effects immediately from the conditions we knew were happening. And so... I found that in my area, which is very conservative, Salt Lake City is actually a very progressive city. I call it a bright blue dot in a deep red sea. Um, because in Salt Lake City, it wasn't an issue, but, but to be successful in this work, we've got to be able to work regionally, as Mayor Broom described, uh, and collaboratively with a lot of different partners. Um, and so I found uh, that I could use language and talk about things that everybody could relate to in our area. And it's very local in that respect. So for us, 
a uh, snowpack is both important for skiing, but it is more important because of our water supply. We're the second most arid state in the country. And we rely on our snowpack heavily and as it melts to provide our water supply through the year. And when we start seeing changes in our snowpack, first by elevation, you know, lower elevations, we've started losing snowpack. And then as seasonally, we're seeing the changes with snowpack and reduced water flow and, and the sort of storage that snow represents through the year. I could talk about that in a very specific way that people could see and feel the impacts. Uh, we have serious air quality problems in the Salt Lake and Wasatch Front region. I could talk about air quality and how that those, those worsening conditions are exacerbated by uh, by increasing temperatures or um, and then could translate that um, as best I could and in terms of actions at the city level into our transportation system and moving away from an as much an auto centric transportation system to a true multimodal system and and I could do it without sort of bringing on the ideological and sort of partisan reactions you get from talking about climate change. So for me, um, now I think, and I'm seeing this in the state, which I almost couldn't have imagined five years ago, people are talking regularly about climate change regardless of their ideology, but that wasn't true 10 or 15 years ago. That's a, that's a terrific history. And uh, I think people have seen that, um, that movement um, and uh, Sharon Mayor Broom uh, would love to hear your perspective as well because um, you can be the same kind of blue dot in the Red Sea. <laughs> and, and I remember I was sitting at a table with several mayors from Louisiana um, at a National League of Cities event and uh, several people said, I don't care what you call it, I just know what I see happening in my community. And there, you know, there are a lot of Republican mayors and a lot of uh, folks who are looking at the economy. So tell us a little bit about about how it's happened in Baton Rouge. Yeah, I could certainly identify with uh, Ralph's perspective and experiences. Um, I will tell you, you know, I am the co-chair of the uh, Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative and our association of 100 mayors along the Mississippi River. We are fiercely bipartisan. That's what I love about being a part of that organization and the issues. So we, we have uh, worked while climate, cha climate change, I will tell you, uh, has been one of the issues that's in the fabric of our uh, organization. And so um, for those of us on the river corridor, uh, one of the ways that we present our issues to voters and uh, to the congressional delegation um, was to really put a general focus, or maybe I should say a more specific focus, on the economic profile uh, for the Mississippi River. So we could show everyone just how much our economy depended on the ecology and built infrastructure of our region. And so, you know, when you're a mayor, it's, it's, it's like you just said, Jennifer, you know, I, I have said to people, I am not going to debate the issue of climate change with you. I'm just go I've got to fix the problem. And we have a problem, but I'm not going to spend time debating it with you while my people go underwater. So I've got to fix the problem. We know that something is going on. I'm calling it climate change. And in the meantime, we all need to work together to fix the problem. I think our listeners are understanding why cities are leading America <laughs> because mayors get it done, right? Absolutely. The, absolutely. It's uh, we don't have time, you know, the trash got to get picked up. The streets have to be clear. You know, people have to be able to, uh, to go to work uh, and, um, and economics really does connect all of us uh, to make a city function. And, and it's where the rubber meets the road. So, Wow, that's so inspirational. Um, you talked about MRCTI, yeah. River Cities and Towns, which is a, a Path to Positive, one of our partners, and they do terrific work. 
Uh, and I know that uh, Ralph, you've worked with um, the region, with other cities and towns in Utah, with the Central Wasatch Commission. Talk a little bit about the importance of that regional and statewide collaboration. How does that really help move climate plans forward? And, and what are some of the challenges? Yeah, thank you. I was, and I was interested in hearing Sharon's comments in terms of the Mississippi River cities and towns. Uh, in, in Utah, um, I gained an appreciation for this um, as mayor and working regionally and nationally uh, there is a, a long tradition around major issues of, of people coming together, private and public sectors coming together, whether it's transportation infrastructure or we've seen it recently, uh, more recently in immigration. And we're, we're really approaching this now in terms of climate change, I think, for the first time. Um, but, you know, in my experience, both professionally outside of um, of my work in the in the elected world and the political world, um, there's no question in my mind that if we want to get things done, um, it takes people working together. And you don't get that sense when you look at the national political scene today, but it's the reality on the ground, it, as we can all attest to who who've worked. Um, and our political jurisdictions don't match our regional realities. And so we, we have to find ways to work together. And, you know, a city like Baton Rouge or a city like Salt Lake or Charlotte can sort of model good, you know, good behaviors and good actions. Um, but to really get things done, we've got to work regionally. Uh, the organization I'm working for now, the Central Wasatch Commission, is actually, I, I think, just about unique in the country and that it was formed by local elected officials to protect our mountains. And we've already talked a little bit about how climate and our mountains here are so closely connected uh, and to provide for solutions, whether it's solutions around uh, providing better preservation and protection of the resources or whether it's solutions in terms of transportation issues and climate is just actually just part of the discussion, I'm glad to say, among local government officials and the elected officials kind of are the leaders of, the, of this commission and make up the board. Uh, but we're seeing this happen in Utah, I'd say, in a couple of ways where people are reaching regionally, both within our ex exact Wasatch Front and back region, but also regionally um, and nationally. Um, one is we are in the process and intend next month to put out something called a Utah Compact on, on, clean, on climate and clean energy. And it, it's, uh, it follows a pattern that was done around immigration when the sort of wave of anti-immigration sentiment and some really horrible legislation was being considered and adopted in some parts of the country. Uh, the Utah leadership, private and public, came together and said, that is not Utah, uh, and, and developed a compact that was more inviting, I will say, of immigrants, and not what you would expect from a conservative state like Utah. Um, we're developing something, uh, and have really come close to completing it now in Utah, on a, a compact on climate and clean energy, which talks about the importance of health, talks about the new economy, talks about the need to be out front on these issues to address air quality and, and climate issues. Uh, we've also seen, led by Mayor Bierman um, in, uh, in Park City, a Mountain Towns 2030 initiative, which includes a pledge to go net zero by 2030 for Mountain Towns all around our region. Um, and they had a conference uh, last year that brought all of these communities, dozens of communities together to, to sh both share success stories, but also to commit to doing a lot more. Um, so I think we're seeing in Utah a real change that I wouldn't have even guessed possible five years ago um, to bring the region together, bring private and public sectors together. And we've got, you know, great, I know that uh, Eco America works closely, for example, with Utah Clean Energy, which is a remarkable local advocacy group 
for clean energy and, and climate change. And, um, you know, they've kind of almost led the way for us in bringing all the various sectors together and the region together. So we're seeing, I say, more positive things than we have in the past. We still have this enormous naysayer group and enormous group that are resistant to taking these issues on. Um, but the transformation is underway. Thanks yes. for that. Um, Utah Clean Energy is another partner of Path the Positive, and uh, they're doing great work. Good to hear the collaboration. I had a couple of questions come in that I'm going to combine because they're from the perspective of citizens. Uh, and in working with citizens, you know, one of the things I always tell folks is don't just go to your political party elected officials because everybody is voting on these things. Um, what are some of the things that you all have found to engage citizens, to have uh, help move citizens to uh, help citizens move the communities to climate action? That's a question from Bob. And then a question from Jill uh, was, how can scientists help? How can scientists help be a voice or be advocates to move the community to climate action? So citizens in general and then scientists as part of that. Yeah. The ones first. Well, I believe one of the ways that you get uh, citizens involved is you start early in the education process. Uh, and so for what I mean, I mean, you get our young citizens involved. Uh, I was so delighted to see a uh, young eighth grader. Um, I think he's an eighth grade, might have been sixth or seventh grade. But at the point I'm trying to make is that he was connected to what is going on in the environment. So he went to a meeting with his father, an environmental uh, meeting, and he got connected. And so he took on the mantra of uh, fighting for clean water. And now he's you know, received uh, accolades throughout our city. Well, what uh, that certainly, when you have young people involved, that helps elevate an issue, right? Because they get attention, people tend to look. And then on the other end, when you have, uh, you know, our, our citizens who are connected, for example, in our area to, to clean water uh, uh, issues, uh, then when they start their advocacy, uh, it certainly helps bring awareness. Sometimes elected officials don't get the attention that citizens do when they start advocating for an issue. Uh, and then you talked about the scientists. We've got to have the scientists at the top tier pushing out the information, being the strongest voice on the issue. So it's just like I'll make an analogy of what we're dealing right now, not on an environmental uh, issue, but on a health issue. We're dealing with a global pandemic. And the scientists, the researchers, the medical profes uh, professionals have to be the gold standard of who we listen to for accurate information, uh, uh, for insightful information, and for meaningful information that helps us shape these policies. So scientists have to be at the forefront on this as well. And Ralph, yeah, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, so I'll just second what, uh, what Sharon, what Mayor Broom has said. Um, and, and I noted really uh, in the last panel that I uh, was watching um, with Eco America, you had three sessions. Um, the most powerful session to me as an observer were the youth. Uh, they, they not only get it, they also know that we've sort of messed up their future uh, by not taking this on very seriously. And the community will not ignore the youth the way they do some of us who've been around too long in their opinion, you know? And so I, th you know, I really do think that engaging the youth where this is not uh, a question for them, this is a reality for their future is really a strong uh, element in terms of citizen involvement. And then just supporting the various groups out there that are being advocates. 
you know, whether we agree with them 100% of the time or not, um, making sure that their voices are at the table and heard and, and reflected, uh, I think helps us as well. Um, I was thinking uh, when, when we talked about scientists, when I was mayor, um, the governor of our state for a good part of that time was Governor Huntsman, who's, you know, proceeded to be um, national and international in his, uh, in his work. And he had been going to some governor's meetings where climate was coming up as a big issue and he was trying to decide how to deal with it. So he put together a blue ribbon commission. Um, and uh, as he was gathering us together, he said, well, I wanna get to the bottom of this in terms of science and collect the best scientists in Utah. And the rest of us responded saying, we didn't come here to wait for a year for you to study this issue. We wanna take it on. So he separately gathered, um, as many of us have done, sort of the best scientific thinking um, around the state uh, to advise him on the issue. And he did that kind of separately outside of our, our action-oriented group. Um, but, you know, we're in an era now where scientists aren't always well received, uh, which I, is incomprehensible to me, but it's a reality. And I think that's where the work that you're doing in Eco America of bringing, uh, of bringing health professionals, of bringing uh, the faith community, uh, of bringing business leaders forward. You know, sometimes those are going to have to be our connectors who understand and get the science, but aren't scientists who in some quarters, unfortunately, are viewed with skepticism. Those are great answers. And I hope that if there are scientists listening, they know that their voice is needed. Uh, absolutely. Um, speaking to a city council uh, or a county commission or a state legislature, uh, just like the youth, um, who, can, who can not listen to a 12 year old who is so earnest about listening to the scientists and saving their future? Um, those are such great points. Um, I see that in the chat we've shared, we did some research on youth and uh, how they're helping raise awareness uh, of what's going on with climate because they have such an authentic perspective because they will be so greatly impacted. Uh, so thanks for raising that. And also, Ralph, thanks for mentioning our other programs, Climate for Health and Blessed Tomorrow, which are engaging our health and our faith sectors. Uh, absolutely, it takes all of us. Um, so uh, just uh, doing terrific work. I have a I have a question talking about youth that's going to lead us into a little bit of talk about elections. Um, traditionally, you guys, you both run for office. You know what the um, consultants always tell you that, oh, young people don't show up. And so, you know, between the ages of 18 and 24, the voting percentages are low. And so, you know, spend your time with seniors and others. But this is a year like none other. And so I would love to hear your perspectives on whether you think, you know, the election is only a few weeks away. Um, are the youth in your communities highly motivated to vote? And is this going to be different this year? Well, I believe that um, youth, young people, uh, the, the various generations, whether it's millennial, generation X, Y, Z, whatever, I think that you will see a heightened motivation um, around voting. Uh, now, I will uh, couch that in the fact that I am the ultimate optimist. So I always take the optimistic point of view, uh, but hopefully we'll have some data to support that optimism. Um, and, and the reason I say that though, is because Right now, we see an elevated movement of young people engaged in democracy. And I believe we also see uh, uh, young people from those various generations uh, who are not pleased with the current climate, no pun intended, in America uh, right now. And so I believe those will be motivating factors to drive them to the polls for change. I believe change is in the air, transformation is in the air, and, and many of our younger 
uh, generation is, is, is captivated and committed to that. Uh, so I believe that, um, you know, come the next 54 days that hopefully my optimism will prove to be uh, accurate at the polls. Yeah, I, um, I am hopeful as well. Uh, Sharon, you and Jennifer and I have all been involved in campaigns for a, a long time. And we know what the numbers say, that the youth does not vote. The 18 to 24 year old segment is half, maybe half of the, of the 55 and older segment in terms of the cohorts of the population that vote. Um, if there's ever a time uh, when the youth need to transform the energy that they're showing us on the streets and, and in their worlds that we see regularly um, through the media and, and that we see in our communities uh, into voting, this is the time. Leadership matters. Um, when Mayor when Mayor Broom, and I know you did this, Jennifer, and I certainly tried to do it in my time, uh, take on an issue and pursue actions proactively, it makes a big difference. When, uh, when you have someone who either is not paying attention or not consistent with views um, that the youth have today, um, it means that things don't get done. And we're past a point in this issue uh, where people can sit back and hope for change in the future. We're, we're well past that point. And the youth get that, but like so many Americans, and I think especially among youth, they don't think their, their vote matters. And you know, how many elections have the three of us seen where the, there's less than a couple hundred votes that decide the outcome of an election, particularly at the local level, but we see it for state legislative races and sometimes even in national races. And um, the youth can make the difference. There's no question the youth can make the difference this year um, in the outcome of elections as it relates to climate. And picking climate leadership um, will mean that that's how government and those who relate to government change. Well, I sure hope there are a lot of uh, young people who are gonna watch and listen, and they're gonna approve uh, the numbers from past years. They're gonna change those numbers because we absolutely need those voices. And uh, it's been fascinating to see the youth voices for um, everything from gun violence to climate to racial justice. And, you know, when you talk about the youth being in the streets. A lot of people have been in the streets and a lot of people are starting to make that connection between racial justice and climate justice. And I would find it interesting to hear your reflection on that. I know that, you know, Eco America, we work with a lot of different groups. And I remember one student um, who was taking one of our trainings say, oh, you know, I didn't think about the fact that people of low income are waiting at the bus stop that doesn't have a cover over it. And that's climate justice because they rely on public transit, but they, they don't have a nice service to keep them comfortable on that transit. And so that's part of climate justice. So people are making those connections. Um, and you know we know communities of color are impacted disproportionately, whether it's COVID or climate or extreme weather. Um, so would love to hear your perspectives on how your citizens are starting to make those connections and how they're moving your communities to action through those connections. That's well, a long question. <laughs> yeah. So we've always had, um, and, and let me start off, Jennifer, by saying this. As you, as you commented, I just thought about the word justice. And uh, as you look at the word justice, there are obviously a lot of different um, uh, types of justice. But at the end of the day, there's a intersection of all, whether it's racial justice, economic justice, uh, environmental justice, et cetera. There's that commonality, that intersection that takes uh, place. Here in uh, my community, 
uh, environmental justice has indeed been an issue. And so we have had uh, grassroots activists for decades who have been on the forefront of advocating for environmental justice because many of our disinvested communities seem to be the location of uh, plants uh, and just other um, entities that are not complementary to a residential lifestyle. And so we've had people fighting on that forefront. So um, uh, the, what you just shared about the uh, disparities that exist in, in disinvested communities, people who have to uh, endure uh, inclement weather uh, because they're not provided with the same amenities as other communities are. So it's very comprehensive, the whole issue of justice. And uh, we can certainly um, uh, break it down into subcategories, but at the end of the day, the ultimate goal should always be an aspiration towards justice on every level uh, for everyone. That's very powerful. Absolutely. Um, Ralph? Well, I, it, I, I think we're seeing more and more of that intersection, as, uh, as Sharon said, between social justice and environmental justice. And it is so blatantly apparent. Um, I think, in, I know in my community, in every community I, I, I go to that, um, people who are disadvantaged lived in places where there are often uh, industrial sites or legacy sites or uh, the pollution is worse because they're surrounded by freeways. And, um, and so those things are readily apparent to most people. And, and I'm seeing, at least at the city level, I'm seeing that being more and more attended to over time and emphasized over time. Um, it's a challenge, I think. It's a challenge for all of us to tie that to climate because, uh, because the climate impacts um, tend to be global, right? They have very localized um, uh, factors uh, in the way uh, the climate crisis um, emerges. But I think as, you know, as, as Sharon was saying, I think at every occasion we need to try to tie those things together. So whether it's, as you were saying, Jennifer, the fact that bus stops don't have shelters or that people don't have bike lanes. I mean, the number of people without an ability to have a car who are getting around either walking or transit or biking and to provide that as a safe and equal way to get around in our community is critically important at the same time we're addressing a justice issue and access equal access issue for people to transportation and jobs and schooling and housing uh, we're also reducing carbon emissions right. um, and having a beneficial impact on the overall problem and challenge that we face so tying all of those things together i think is part of our kind of jobs um, but having that can support it in a community because mayors here, I know that every time you put in a bike lane or made a change on your street, people are wondering why you are disrupting their lives. Yeah. And it's, and they don't immediately though the nimbyism keeps them from making that quick and easy connection to the fact that we're improving the health for everybody in our communities. Yeah, I just I recall um, the whole sidewalk debate that we had in Charlotte because some older neighborhoods it was a car based economy and they didn't have sidewalks and a lot of the African American neighborhoods in Charlotte didn't have sidewalks and um, there were some pedestrians who got hit uh, because they didn't have a car to get in to be safe and they were walking along where there's no sidewalk and that's what it took to spur action and to say we've got to be fair and every community deserves to have a sidewalk so people can safely walk. Uh, but it's, you're right, it's, it's a big debate and making that connection to justice and climate and greenhouse gases, uh, you know, that's some 
that's what uh, elected officials do is the, you know, communicating that, that connection between public service and, um, and priorities and, and spending your taxes. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I hear in, in both your examples is some optimism. Some of the good things that are coming out of the challenges right now, that growing awareness. And one of the things that we emphasize in our communications guidance is co-benefits, win-win. You want people to support what you're talking about by seeing that it's gonna bring benefits. Uh, and so I wonder if each of you has a really good example of something uh, that involved the community that, that was a big win um, that had a lot of benefits that, that might have been a challenge at the beginning, just um, uh, an example that might be inspirational. We always, we're good as cities at um, looking at best practices in other places. Uh, and I always, I call it the case method, um, copy and steal everything. <laughs> You're welcome to share that. <laughs> but absolutely, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So let's hear a good positive example if you can think of one. And uh, Let's inspire some, some of our listeners. And Jennifer, you're looking for uh, inspirational stories that, uh, that were emerged from the community. Would you repeat that for me? I'm sorry. Sure. An, uh, an inspirational story of a change brought about through engaging the community, something that seemed to be difficult. Um, I know in Charlotte, it was putting our first transit line in. <laughs> that, that would be a really good example where we had to go out and communicate a lot and talk about the benefit and so is there, is there a good example in your uh, community of something that, that when you brought people together and, and emphasized the benefits that, that led to something really good from a climate, um, whether resilience or mitigation perspective? I can well, talk. I, maybe I can jump in uh, and then Sharon, please, uh, please give your examples here. But, you know, the two biggest contributors to uh, our climate challenge, climate crisis, uh, our transportation issues and buildings. Um, and in my mind, uh, we need to look at and think comprehensively about what we do because it's not just one quick fix or one solution to the issues. It's a change in the areas that are the biggest contributors to, uh, to carbon emissions. Um, so I, I'll just say that in the, I mentioned before that, um, you know, one of the things I had decided to take on was to shift um, our city's uh, orientation around transportation from providing for automobiles and dealing with parking to providing for all modes of transportation. Uh, I came in in 2008 when the Great Recession hit so we suffered an enormous uh, downturn in our revenues. Uh, but I was committed to seeing, all right, uh, I campaigned and said, we're going to double bike lanes in the city because I was hearing from people they were scared to get out on their bikes in the city, re reasonably so. Um, I committed, I was going to double bike lanes. Well, within two years, with a reduction in city funding, we doubled bike lanes. It doesn't cost much to put in bike lanes. Um, and what I did as I went through my first capital budget is um, every time there was some leftover money from a project or there was a project that wasn't getting started or a project that could be delayed, which is what we were looking at, I set that money aside and we committed enough money that within two years we doubled bike lanes in the city. And then we went further and and, uh, and took on putting in separate, separated bike lanes, which was met with enormous resistance. Today, all of those things are well accepted. We put in a light rail line to the airport, you know, like, kind of like what you were able to get, you know, get going in, uh, in Charlotte, Jennifer. Um, we got in a, a light rail line to the airport, but we were putting it down a street that was the worst, ugliest arterial going through the most depressed neighborhood in Salt Lake. We said, we're gonna completely rebuild this street and make it a model arterial, major commuting street. Uh, and we put in on street bike lanes. We put in an off street shared path. We put in uh, a light rail down the middle of the road. We reduced the lanes without 
you know, affecting traffic and engage the whole community in it, it's now the most beautiful street in the city. Uh, it's taking time for all the transformation that happens with transit-oriented development. We redid all of our zoning around, you know, around that street as well. So, you know, in the transportation side, you know, there's some clear things we know we can do. On the building side, um, I didn't want to get into heavy regulatory mode, so I copied, as you were saying, stole from Chicago, the idea of saying if you go for lead gold a lead building, um, we're going to move you to the front of the permitting line. Okay, that didn't cost us anything, but it helps with the time cost of money for a developer. And we had developers who never would have thought about how much energy their building was using or how much they could save by going with alternative energy resources, who adopted that and at the end of it said, and it saved us money. We had the developers telling us that. So you know, there are things we can do, and it takes, I think, a comprehensive approach to really get there. Those those co-benefits that we talk about, yeah. for sure. Sharon, have you thought of an example? Yeah, I did, and Ralph helped, uh, helped me think of it. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, <laughs> and, and so when I came in office, um, there was a project that had been proposed, and it was a uh, downtown tram that would travel to uh, I'm sure you all have heard of Tiger Stadium in LSU, um, and, and it was a, a short uh, focus of a tram, a short mileage, I would say, but it was going to take um, uh, about $170 million to make this happen for just a few miles. Um, and so I was very concerned about the minimal impact that these amount of dollars would have on a short... Um, um, on, on a short mileage, you know, that existed. And so um, I um, stopped the project and went to enlarging it to a more, uh, to a broader concept. And that is that our redevelopment authority was working on what they call the Plank Road uh, Corridor Project. And the Plank Road Corridor Project uh, is focused on a disinvested area of Baton Rouge. And so in conjunction with the Plank Road Corridor Project, we decided uh, after collaborating with our uh, bus system that we could change that tram for just a few miles to uh, a broader uh, reach on Plank Road uh, and do a mass, a massive transit tram type uh, initiative. And so now we have a uh, project that is going to go from an area of disinvestment, which is being revitalized all the way to downtown to LSU covering a uh, much uh, more mileage. And uh, so your original point was, but to make that happen, we had to come uh, together around the table and talk about the possibilities, talk about the reality what, of what was uh, proposed and talk about what could happen. We had to get some stakeholders involved. Now, I will tell you, everybody wasn't happy that I did that, but at the end of the day, guess what? We ended up um, having uh, uh, spending less money and getting more money from uh, the feds to do this project. Uh, so that's an example of what, you know, if you come together and get uh, stakeholders to sometimes um, revisit issues uh, where you can have a broader impact for your community. And that has been one of my goals as mayor president is to look at our city through a lens of equity and inclusion, because for far too long, we have not done that. And when we realize whether it's around climate change or just like we said earlier, whether it's around social justice issues or environmental justice issues, you know, when we look at the overall um, uh, intersection of communities, and I talk about that all the time, you cannot, let's just say, have a community that's suffering with environmental justice and don't think at some point it won't reach your community because you live on the other end of town. 
A perfect example is that, uh, and I, I know I'm going on on it, but a perfect example is we had a an affluent community uh, where a barge wanted to be housed near the river. Well, they were up in arms about it. And so the communities of disinvestment said, welcome to our world. <laughs> We've been dealing with this for decades. And so through that, there was a uh, more of a sympathy and empathy that came from the affluent community who committed to be stakeholders and helping the communities uh, that weren't as affluent in fighting issues on environmental uh, justice. Uh, so those are the type of things that happen when people realize that you can't have uh, part of your community at an A grade on an issue and part of your community at a D grade on your issue and think everything is going well. You've got to get that D grade up. And so that means that we have to realize the, um, uh, the commonality and the intersection of communities that is so necessary uh, to have uh, great cities. Wow, I could listen to both of you forever. <laughs> There are so many learnings and so many inspirational examples. And wow, um, absolutely, mayors have to tackle tough, tough problems. And you know, the Eco America model, motto is start with people, stay with people. I like that. I'm a, may I use that in one of my upcoming speeches? <laughs> Please do. Start with people, stay with people. And you have, I'll give you all credit. Okay. <laughs> You've both shown that that's how you make progress, making those connections uh, between diverse communities uh, and showing how we all are part of the same future. And it, it's, you know, it takes all of us. It, it absolutely takes all of us. There's an African proverb that um, if all of us work together, we can lift the sky. I like that. That's what, yeah, another good one. So, wow, we're almost at the end of our time. I think we have time for the answer to one more question if you each take a minute. And uh, we had a great question come in that's, that's um, I'm gonna give you an option. You can answer one of two questions. So the great, wait, great question that came in from Joel was how do we get um, people who aren't in our tribe to be part of the solution? How do we reach out to farmers, ranchers, uh, rural areas to work with our urban communities on, and even across parties. So that's one, one answer, or um, one option. The second option is what gives you hope going into this very, very hyper-partisan election season that we're gonna come out and we're gonna be united around climate, that climate's gonna be a voting issue and we're gonna move forward after November. So you can either answer, how do you bring in other tribes or what gives you hope? And you have a minute. <laughs> That's hard. I'll start. <laughs> I'll talk about what gives, gives, gives me hope in terms of climate change. And as we go into this uh, election cycle, what gives me hope is if you talk to the average uh, uh, citizen, whether they're uh, here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or whether um, they are in Chicago, Illinois, uh, there are common denominators of progress that we all desire. There are common denominators of concerns that we, we have. And so I believe those shared goals, those shared concerns will serve as a catalyst to move us forward in areas such as climate change where there are more people, I believe, who are concerned about climate change than those who are not concerned about climate change. And so that is what gives me hope. That's what gives me optimism. Fabulous. Ralph, you get to wrap it up. And you're on mute. You're on mute, mute. Mayor Becker, you're still on mute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'll take on the tribal issue quickly here. Um, because we're all in our tribes and I think you know the sense of that comment that I saw in the chat is you know we we tend to live in those bubbles more and more um, today. Uh, my own experience has been that we don't convert people by telling them anything. Um, 
on an issue like this. And, and, we, and we often, unfortunately, don't convert them with information and facts, um, regardless of how clear it is to those of us um, who, who understand them. Uh, it comes from uh, starting with relationships, as you were saying, and connecting with people in other ways and expressing an interest in their world uh, and gaining some of their confidence and trust uh, through personal relationships. Uh, and whether, and that's the reason one of the things I like so much about Eco America is whether that's through their faith based world or their community and civic world or their business and working world, um, finding ways to connect people in their uh, environment where they're receptive um, has to be the starting point because people are so polarized today and they're not, we're not, we're not listening very well to each other. Um, so trying to bridge those gaps in ways that aren't around issues where there's an ideological response, I think is going to be a key. And I'm encouraged that we're seeing those changes um, and that it's, it may not be happening fast enough for many of us, um, but it is, it is happening. And that uh, I'm really hopeful that people engaging, whether it's just by voting, which is our most basic right, or whether it's by being active in some form in our community, that's, that's how we're going to see the changes that we really desperately need at this point. You all have, uh, you have both been so lovely to talk with, and uh, I am going to be walking about nine feet higher all day because <laughs> you're so inspirational. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And for those who are listening, if this was so inspiring and you want to listen again, we actually have all these episodes on our YouTube channel, so you can listen again, and you can also share with your friends who didn't get a chance to hear this inspirational message today. So um, thank you both so very much. And uh, this has been a terrific episode uh, of Let's Talk Climate. And uh, we, will, we will see you um, uh, hopefully on other Eco America events. And um, we are gonna continue our Let's Talk series. Um, next week will be again on Thursday, September 17th. And the topic then is a vote for health is a vote for climate. And that's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern. Again, you can engage with us online at hashtag Let's Talk Climate. Subscribe and follow us. Share with your friends, family, your policymakers who you need to help make the connection. Um, all of our resources on leadership, um, on climate communications, and our episodes on climate, act climate action and advocacy. Um, we want to help you move your community forward to climate action and to move our country forward. Thanks again so much for listening. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, too. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, y'all were awesome. I'm going to listen to it again. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank Thanks. you, too. Take care. Take care. Be safe.